Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Mark Resipsinski and I, Niels Kastrolarsen, where each week we take the polls of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. Mark, it is great to be back with you this week. How are you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. Middle of the summer, you know, we'll probably sort of save my town. I think more people are going out on on vacation or they should be starting in on August and the place empties out. So that's when I like my town the most. It's it's yeah. relatively empty. <laughs> it's pretty empty here in Zug at the moment, I have to say. But um, you know what day it is? It is the day where the Olympics starts, which is very uh, exciting uh, in many ways. Um, and so I obviously hope you are, are, are ready for it. I don't know if you are interested in, in these type of, of events, but it, it, it inspired me a little bit to to bring up a kind of a surprise question for you, Mark, because I know you're up for okay. it. Okay. <laughs> so the, surprise, the, 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 the silly and surprise question is, if trend following was an Olympic sport, which one would you say it is? Ooh, that's a, that's a good one. So, so, so if it was the, uh, uh, the winter Olympics, then it would be, you know, those, uh, those guys who do the ski jumping, <laughs> that, 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 uh, where it could be, you know, either graceful or the agony of defeat, uh, and, and a, and a crash, uh, because we see these ups and downs with managed futures. Now in, um, in, uh, summer Olympics, it's not really, uh, it's harder to say but I, th I think it's closer to more long distance running as opposed to a sprint. You know what? It's so funny. I mean, when I thought of this silly question a few minutes ago, I didn't necessarily have a good answer myself. So I, I, I asked chat GBT because I thought who else to ask. And, uh, but actually you're spot on. So chat, chat GBT and, and I kind of, it was kind of a test to also find out, does it really understand uh, trend following? Chat GBT came back and said, well, if trend following was an Olympic sport, it would be likely to be akin to marathon running. And here's why. And it goes through four points, but it ends up summarizing it saying, in essence, the qualities that makes a successful marathon runner, endurance, consistency, adaptability, risk management, and strategic planning are also essential for successful trend following in financial markets. I thought that was pretty good. Wow. That, <laughs> I'm amazed that that's uh, what ChatGPT came with. And I'm also amazed that I've sort of matched <laughs> this. Is, <laughs> It was That's completely unfair to do this on you, but uh, you did uh, very well. And it, it certainly proves that you know your trend following, Mark, for, <laughs> for sure. Anyways, uh, as always, uh, what I'd love to hear, sort of more broadly, actually, before we dive into our topics, um, is just kind of what's been um, on your radar uh, recently, um, just if something has come up that you find interesting. You know, the, the topic that I found most interesting, and this is in the last week, was Good friend, very good investor. Uh, we we share conversations at least once a week. He said, "Have you seen this paper on activist treasury issuance and uh, monetary policy?" And uh, it's, a, it's a piece that's come out from Hudson Bay Capital. And the basic premise is is that the activist treasury issuance of more bills than coupons has had an impact of providing quantitative e uh, easing that's offset what the Fed has been doing. So we'll sort of say the Fed and the Treasury, so they're, they're following offsetting policies. Fed trying to t uh, tighten financial conditions, and the Treasury, through its issuance, if it issues less coupon bonds, then that means that those coupon bonds become scarcer, prices go up, 
And at the same time, this is that they're providing more treasury bills, which is near money or as close to money as you can get. And so it's f- actually following an offsetting policy. And, and the numbers are, are staggering in terms of the size of the difference of issuance. And so you have to ask the question, well, why is the U.S. economy doing so well? And why did the transition to lower inflation take so long? And why are financial conditions still relatively, you know, positive in the U.S. economy? And this tug of war uh, issue between Treasury and Fed seems to make sense, and it's an area that I want to explore more. And I know that it sounds like you know you've had other conversations and other podcasts, but but I think this is a very intriguing issue. Well, I did notice that um, not the last episode, but the week before, uh, Alan was speaking to Adam Poson, who obviously used to be a central banker himself. And he was quite taken back by the fact that the U.S. didn't issue long, very long-dated bonds uh, when they had the chance a few years ago, like we saw in Austria and, and maybe in other countries uh, when interest rates were so low, why didn't they lock in some long-term uh, financing? So, um, and and there was a, a bit of conversation about that, uh, and which I th- actually thought was quite interesting. But maybe you, for those who may not be uh, following this so closely, Mark, why what what is the case they make for um, issuing shorter-term debt being more um, accommodative rather than long-term debt? Well, there's a there's a couple things going on. First, there's a greater demand for treasury bills because of the way we've changed the regulations on um, money market funds. That came around in 2016. So, so there has been this natural stronger demand for shorter term instruments. So, the treasury might actually add more uh, issuance. But when you the treasury issues uh, bills. Bills can be posted as collateral for uh, you know, for for uh, lending. Uh, it's collateral that's needed by a lot of institutions, and so it actually has the characteristics of like being money. So if you issue more uh, bills, it's as if you're issuing more money. Alternatively, is this is that if you uh, stop issuing coupon bonds, coupon bonds because they have longer duration are risky assets. Because they're risky assets, this is that uh, there's going to be a limited, uh, you know, uh, there, there's a limited ultimate demand or aggregate demand for those coupons. And so what happens is, is that uh, treasuries have been uh, bid up because uh, there's been uh, less coupon supply available. And if that occurs, then long-term interest rates are going to be lower which is good for financial conditions. So when you think about it, this supply can have an impact on the shape of the yield curve. It can also have an uh, impact on the amount of risky assets outstanding. And it also can have an impact on the amount of near money that's available. And so what happens is, is that the Treasury usually has this as uh, a rule of thumb to say about when we issue debt, We'll do about 15% in bills and the rest in coupons. They've done numbers that are much higher on the on the bill side. And so because of that, that that has actually had a big impact on the supply relative to demand along the yield curve. And that has an in- impact on financial conditions. Absolutely. And and it is interesting in a sense because okay, maybe we do talk about this from time to time. We don't talk a lot about it, and we certainly maybe don't think about it so much that this is not the Fed doing it, right? This is this is the Treasury controlling this, and so they can kind of offset all the good work that, quote-unquote, good work that the Fed is doing, trying to bring down, you know, or being, you know, kind of restrictive in its policy, and then they come come along and, 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 and offset some of those effects. Right. And so when you think about, uh, we, we, while we've always focused in more recently on interest rates, there is the backdrop. The Fed is still doing QT, the quantitative tightening on the supply side, on their balance sheet. And so every uh, month when they sort of uh, sell off more of their coupon portion of their balance sheet, 
Okay, that's like adding supply to the market. Okay, so uh, in some senses, is that if the Treasury doesn't issue coupon bonds, then in some sense, it's it's actually sort of offsetting the pressures that have been put in from the from the Fed when it actually sort of sells off their uh, their coupon securities as part of quantitative tightening. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, on my radar, Mark, to be perfectly frank, um, it has to do with trend following, uh, unsurprising. But it is, quote unquote, inspired is maybe not the right word, but it is a little bit uh, related to this somewhat relentless give back of performance that trend followers have experienced in the past three months. And actually, it continued in July Um even after a very good start to the month, we're kind of completely given that back, and 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 we're in you know in the red as an industry uh, for the month of July, and it's going to certainly um, uh, foster conversations uh, with investors, potential investors, because these are the periods that they don't like. Of course, uh, the the optimist in me will say, well, it also opens up for some great entry points. Because still around, you know, in terms of investors, there are still way too few who have exposure to trend following and those who have are probably not enough of it. So I don't know if it coincides with the, whether there is a link to the fact that there seems to be a little bit more calm in terms of where inflation is going. Obviously, there's some numbers coming out today, I think, as we record PCE. But, you know, inflation concerns are maybe not as 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 high as they were before. Um, and um, and and rates are, are subsiding to to some extent. So so I don't know if if we are sort of if if we are sort of opening up the debate about well if everything calms down again, trend followers might have a, a bit of a struggle like they had in the uh, the ten years uh, leading into two thousand and nineteen where everything was well controlled by central banks. I, I'm not sure we're there uh, yet, but. What are the thoughts? Uh, what What are your thoughts about these things when um, when we go through one of these uh, periods? Well, this is the age old problem with trend following. In the sense, this is that uh, we've done a very good job, trend followers in general, of talking about crisis alpha, and very good job of talking about here's the benefits of trend following when there may be a sell off in other risky assets like equities, but. There's a cost with that, and the cost with that of having low correlation is the fact that when there's calm periods in the market, such as when uh, where we have interest rates, if uh, volatility has come down, obviously with inflation, inflation volatility and uncertainty has come down, is, is that, and markets in general might be a little bit more sideways or they're retracting from highs, this is that you're going to have bad perfor uh, performance. And then when you people look at their uh, their portfolio and they see, look at all these things that are doing well because a lot of alternative investments have done well so far this year. And then they look at trend following and they see it's negative. They'll say, why do I have this in my portfolio? And what you find is, is that they'll forget fairly quickly the benefits of when the market turns down because when they look at it today over the last three months or for the year to date, and they say, how do I rebalance my portfolio? It doesn't look like you should have those trend followers there at the bottom of the list relative to many other strategies at this current point in the year. Yeah. As you're talking, I just see the screen uh, lighting up here with PCE numbers coming in a little bit higher than than what was expected. So anyways, uh, an, an ongoing story for sure. But it did lead us into talking a little bit about trend following. As I mentioned, in terms of trend following, We've had another week of uh, the continuation that we've seen the last few weeks or few months, actually. Um, and we've had, you know, quite a few, almost like a series of reversals in different markets, different sectors uh, in the last uh, few weeks as well. Uh, certainly uh, this month so far, currencies have been, uh, as far as I can tell, has been hit pretty hard, uh, not least from the, the strength, the newfound strength of the Japanese uh, yen. So that's been a major challenge. Um, but also equities, metals, energy, fixed income, not a lot of uh, sort of consistency uh, from a trend following perspective. Um, so it is just one of those transition periods that we are uh, going through right now. My own trend barometer closed yesterday at 36. That's weak. 
it's not super weak, but it is weak. So it certainly suggests a negative month so far for the um, for the industry. And if I look at the numbers, the BTOP 50 index as of uh, Wednesday night, it must be, uh, was down in 1.48%, uh, uh, up 5.47% for the year. Such and CTA index down 2.19% in July, up 4.91%. Uh, for the year, Sokjen trend index down 2.21% for the year month and up 6.28% for the year. And the short-term traders index also in negative territory in July, down 1.17%, uh, but also down for the year, down uh, 12 basis points so far. On the flip side, MSCI World only down 60 basis points in July after having been up strong, of course, uh, still up 10% or so uh, for the year. The S&P Global Developed Sovereign Bond Index, which is a new index I had to shift to since they stopped publishing the World Government Bond Index, it's up about 1% in July, but down 26 basis points so far in uh, this year. And the S&P 500 is down 1% as of last night, up 14% so far uh, this year. Anything else you want to add to um, to the trend-following part? No, and then uh, other than the fact that... Uh you know, three months don't make a year. <laughs> it certainly doesn't. Prefer. That's true. All right. Well, we uh, we will stay with trend for a little bit longer. We had a question in from Philip. Uh, Philip writes, I have a question for whoever you think uh, would like to answer it. And I was thinking of you, Mark. You might have addressed this topic already. Uh, in that case, apologies in the email. I'm, we may have over t- over the years, but let's just do it again. Different trend followers will have different rules to include a new asset, but the gist of it seems, understandably, does it add uh, enough value relative to transaction cost and opportunity cost of not holding uh, other assets anymore? So usually uh, not an obvious choice, only trade-offs. Um Now, his question is, or Philip's question is, uh, the opposite side of that, when to remove an asset. He writes, I find it more difficult to decide when to remove an asset. Typically, one will not remove any given asset unless something bad happens or a new asset takes over from an older one. The most frequent example would be in FX, I guess, uh, what did trend followers choose to do with the Swiss franc when it was pegged? Uh, At least... For this example, there was a clear decision by the Swiss National Bank. But when there was a soft peg or the fussy feeling that something is happening, uh, it is hard to quantify exactly what to do. Some will argue that if vol is too low, then the asset is out. And other hints. So, um, what are your thoughts on on this uh, conundrum for a trend follower? This is really a tough question. One is because it, on one hand, you think that I'll add an asset if it adds diversification, okay? But then you have to ask the question is about what about performance? But, you know, past performance is not indicative of future success. And so if, let's say, a, a market has been trading poorly over the last few years, that doesn't mean it's going to trade poorly going forward. There is a one argument I had with, with a large trend follower and we had one market that was trading and it it was uh, in a drawdown for could have been five years we just had not made money from this market and we sort of said well by this time we say like we got to drop this out of the out of portfolio and so the one argument was this is that you know something's broken something's wrong with this you know, let's drop it out. And the other idea was, is that, no, it's a diversifier. We don't know what the future is going to hold. Let's keep it in. So, so, so that's one example. Other example is, is that let's take the example of uh, short-term interest rates, like Euro dollars. I remember, and it was one of my great forecasts, I say, say, rates are never going to go below zero. So therefore, uh, and if we're getting close to the zero bound, Let's of course drop that market because it's a one-sided market. You know we're going to get uh, we're going to get blasted if let's say that we we go long at close to zero. Of course, what do we know? What happened? Mar- markets went below zero, so th- so uh, there was a good reason to continue to hold that into the portfolio. FX is another example. Is this is it? There's a lot of central bank intervention. Central banks actually intervene because they want to punish speculators. 
So should you hold and trade in trends of a market where you have a central bank that's not a profit ma maximizer who wants to punish your behavior? So again, it certainly suggests that you should lower, uh, lower your exposure. I will sort of say that I, we always did a review of markets, and I still do the same when we look at uh, whether a market should be added to a portfolio. And then, and this is done on a regular basis where we'd say, is there a reason to drop markets? One is, is that you want to have two-sided markets where you have hedgers and both speculators. If it's pure speculative, then that could be a, a, a problem. Second, you'd love to have more retail as opposed to all professional traders. If it's all professional traders, it's going to be harder to make money. Okay. Uh, second, uh, you know, or third, you sort of say, let's look at minimum open interest and minimum volume. So if I have a portfolio, uh, a portfolio with a number of markets and the volume starts to fall below a certain threshold or open interest falls, I'd want to drop it out because, uh, because then, then you could get more likely a jump risk, which could work against you. Uh, we'll also sort of say is, is, is it, uh, uh, has it been, uh, we want to have a market that has been established for a while. So a brand new market that just started trading and eh, we might want to avoid that. Okay. But again, that's before we add as opposed to dropping it out. And finally, we, we'd actually want to look at, uh, the tests for that market and we want to try to sort of see. Not so much if it makes money or loses money, but how it makes the money and lose the money. Is it all coming in with a single trade? Has there been a certain amount of choppiness in the behavior relative to the past? And that might have an influence on whether we should drop it. Generally, I'd sort of say that uh, you want to be very careful in adding markets so that then you don't have to be posed with the problem of whether you should drop it in uh, later on. So, but... This is a very tough question. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think you, the, the, the points that I would gravitate towards are obviously uh, liquidity. Uh, that's that's a clear warning sign. If liquidity drops, you definitely want to get uh, rid of the market, uh, I think, in, in, in many respects. But I think the, uh, the one about the volatility and all of those things, I think that's easier to deal with because, you know, all managers, I, I, you know, all large managers, they will look at volatility over different time frames, and they're not going to just uh, have a shorter term volatility measure that could, as we saw with the Swiss, um, the the Euro Swiss and 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 um, the Swiss franc, but also uh, with shorter term interest rates, where clearly the volatility just got sucked out of that market for a while. And and there you have to have some safeguards, some volatility flaws that you know doesn't uh, prevent you is the word I'm looking for here. Prevent you from sizing up and and getting really badly hurt. So I think there are mechanisms you you can do. But I think the the bigger one, which is more challenging to do, but where I think we have a a, a perfect example as a, as a reminder uh, for why you should be careful removing markets just because they haven't been profitable for a while. And when I say for a while, I mean, Coco literally was not profitable as far as I can tell for the last 15 or 20 years prior to the beginning of January 2023. It was a tough, tough market to trade. Of course, it would be profitable from time to time. So I think there's two things that that that, that example shows. One is that it can turn out to be incredibly profitable. And we know for certain managers, it's made so much money for them that it's, you know, the only market that they've really made their profits in. But the other thing is, as you point out, is also, or allude to at least, is when does it make money? I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a market that doesn't really make money for you if it makes money when a lot of other things is not making money for you in your portfolio. Then it adds some some diversification value. So, so but, you know, I think a lot of trend followers will be aware of these uh, things, but... Uh, and that's why I think that very few markets get taken out of portfolios, except for liquidity concerns. That's a pretty clear uh, black and white issue, I think, for most managers. Right. The, the Coco example is probably the poster child of uh, something that was choppy. Uh, there will sort of say that you have, you know, governments that have uh, commodity boards that actually can manipulate price. So 
So there's a whole set of reasons for why you wouldn't want to trade cocoa. And then along comes this, uh, this big supply dislocation. And, uh, and if you didn't have cocoa in your portfolio, uh, I think you could sort of really see the difference. And, you know, I follow some, um, indices uh, like the, the old, uh, you know, managed futures index from Credit Suisse doesn't include cocoa. It's a, I think a very well constructed index, but it, it, it underperformed relative to a lot of CTAs who did have cocoa. And that was just a, because of this explosive return. The other thing you find is, is, is that when volatility gets lower, okay, because let's say maybe it's, I don't want to say it's manipulated, but there's some reason for why there's less uh, reason to uh, uh, for markets to move. Sometimes people say, if I'm volatility targeting, I will increase my exposure in those markets that have low volatility. And then if, let's say, there is a spike in volatility, I could be on wrong-sided on that market. That would be the example of a manipulated market like the Swiss franc. This is that volatility got lower. So what would you do? Well, you know, I can't make the same amount of money. I should increase the size of my positions. And that was the worst thing you could possibly do when, when let's say, the peg was, uh, was readjusted. Yeah, and I think this is where experience comes in, right? Because I think most experienced managers would have a volatility flaw knowing full well that you shouldn't be fooled by the fact that it can go to very low levels of volatility for a year, maybe two, but it doesn't mean that that is what you should uh, size your position after. But let's not get into that because the list of topics that you brought along is, as usual, very long and extensive and interesting, of course. Uh, so we'll see how many we uh, we can get through in the next uh, half an hour or so. But the first one kind of relates to what we've talked about, right? Because uh, you wrote a paper not long ago in the Journal of Investing called I've Never Seen a Bad Backtest. And I think it got a lot of uh, um, exposure, uh, impressions, and, and, and so on and so forth. So, of course, I'd love for you to, to, uh, to talk through your, your thoughts uh, about that. Well, it was, it was the reason why we're talking about this. I think that you had a question about, uh, you know, whether people actually believe back tests and uh, and how how valuable are they? And I, I probably would sort of say that to, for someone who has done a lot of back testing and have presented it, it uh, both as an as a manager with uh, experience where we're already running uh, money, as well as being a relatively new manager. You know, I've gone through the uh, the throes of having people say, "I don't care about your back test. You know, I'm not uh, I'm not going to invest uh, money in you, and I don't like it." I've also been on uh, as an investor into different managers, and I've had to look at back tests. I would sort of say that they're very valuable. Okay? That doesn't mean that that should be the reason to invest, but they're very valuable. Not so much from a performance and sharp ratio, because I've never seen a bad back test in terms of performance and sharp. But when you talk to the manager and you say, tell me how you went through and did your back test. Tell me the assumptions you used. Tell me how you accounted for transactions. You get insight into the manager in terms of how careful he is with his, uh, with his research how careful he is at being able to account for all of the realism in the market. Also, is is it and people sort of say, well, I can come up with a model and and if, yeah, it won't take me too long, and I'll show that it's it's a uh, fantastic performance. That's not what you're looking for when you look at a back test. What you want us to understand is how does someone build a system, not a model? And there's a difference between the two. I can always come up with a good model. The question is, is that can I take that model and then apply it across a large number of markets, build portfolios, and then uh, build a system? And finally, when you think about backtests, what you have to do is you move from backtest to what I call the factory. And so uh, a backtest, in some sense, is like the scientist who's in the laboratory. So he's, uh, but then when you actually want to build the system that you're going to trade, then you have to take off your scientist hat. You have to put on the hat of an engineer. And then you have to say, I am building a factory. 
And a factory is about a system that has to look at what the inputs are, what's the output, when is the timing, what is uh, what are my costs, how do I form execution? And when I talk with people about their backtest or show backtest, I want to talk to them about how that how we move from that back test and how it uh, that's it's a realistic so it can then be uh exploited as a factory yeah no i like that uh analogy and i and i think that is actually an underrated uh point about uh what it what what it what you can use a back test for i think you're absolutely right that most people will simply just take it you know from a performance point of view and maybe a drawdown point of view and so on and so forth. But but everything that goes into creating it is actually the really interesting part. So uh, I think that might surprise a few people. Now, uh, if I could tell you one small tale, this is, is that uh, in terms of the differences of opinion about backtest, walking in Midtown Manhattan, okay, one to what manager, show, show him some backtested numbers because we, we were using a new model. He looks at me and goes, he goes like, look, I'm never going to invest with anybody who doesn't have a sharp ratio above two. Okay. So, uh, so ours was, a, you know, the back tested number was n- not above two clearly. So, so we left the office, you know, sulking down the street. We have to go to our next meeting, go in the next meeting. And, it, and he said, I said like, wow, is this, is it, uh, I would never invest in it. And, uh, and anything that has a back test, it's above, you know, one and a, qu- uh, a quarter is because uh, I can't believe that you, you could produce, uh, produce those kind of numbers. So in the same midtown uh, location, two different offices, one person said, I'll never look, uh, I'll never invest with someone who has a, uh, a sharp ratio that's, uh, below two. And then another one said, I'll never, uh, invest with anybody who has a sharp ratio of, above two. Above one and so, a quarter, you said. Yes, it is. So, yeah. so crazy. So we'll we'll sort of say that there's a, a lot of different opinions on that. So I would say it's the process of how you do your research, which is more important than the actual numbers you generate. Yeah, yeah, very true. The next point you brought along uh, is more related to systematic trend, uh, as far as I can tell, and. Um, Again, has something to do, I guess, could be related to, uh, well, it is to do with, with systems building and so on and so forth. Um, sim- simplicity versus complexity. Um, where do you want to go with that? Well, th- this is another question that you said you had from our, our, our reader. Is, is, is that uh, uh, when they talked about this, said like, well, it's relatively easy to build a model. This is that what's so difficult about this? Um, and when you think about it, this is that uh, that building a model and this is a, related to our back test is relatively simple but it's a, it's the actual construction of the system which is where the problems come in and it, what you have to think about it is this is that any portfolio you build has to be related to three components one what is the process for return generation two what is the portfolio construction and three what is the risk management so now that I've done some, you know, a more evaluation of managers, when someone comes in and they sort of talk about that, well, I'm a systematic trend follower or systematic managers, then what I really want to do is I don't want to see the, uh, I'll hear the pitch in terms of the total system that they're presenting, but then I want to sort of say, let's break it down into those three components is, is that tell me how you generate signals that will, uh, for your, uh, longs and shorts. So. And in some senses is that uh, if it's more regression based or it's model based, then there's a potential for parameter un- uh, instability. In some sense, you, you actually like simple rules. Uh, second is, is, is that then you say like, well, how do you construct the portfolio? Because that's where you're getting the only free lunch available in finance, which is diversification. And third, you know, I say, well, what's the risk management? The risk management is, is, is it, and you think about it, is, is it, what do you do when something goes wrong? And so the equivalent would be, is, is that the Mike Tyson quote that I like, he says, like, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the nose. So, so if you get punched in the nose, 
what are you going to do to protect the principle of investors? And and when you think about it, is is that market goes against you, you start taking losses, you're getting that's the equivalent of getting punched punched in the nose. Well, then the response in most trend followers and a lot of managers is that I have a stop loss, I walk away. So so in some sense, is is that that's your fail safe. Uh, a good model should incorporate uh, risk management in the portfolio construction and decision rules. You determine when to get long, but then you also have a, uh, a determination of when to exit. So the stop loss is only there because something has gone wrong. And, but there's nothing wrong with having that. But that's that's the idea is that how your protection. So. So when you think about you know systematic trend following, they say, is it easy? Well, it's it may be easy for any one part, but you have to bundle it together as a system. Yeah, no, very true, very true. Good points. Now we're going to jump a little bit uh, away from trend. Um, something you've been writing about um, a couple of times this month because you write a lot of blog posts, more blog posts than than most, I think. I noticed you wrote more than one per day in June alone, so that's pretty pretty amazing. Anyways, the question you uh, you you pose, and and you can take us uh, into this topic, and that is whether people sh- investors should prefer stocks or bonds. Um, so um, tell us tell us a little bit more about that. Well, there's two things that are uh, that have really been. Uh, driving this is is that what's the environment right now because we're seeing an environment where stocks seem to be overvalued is so when we look at on a pe ratio uh certainly is is that when you look at the uh mag six or seven depending on what number you want to have is is that the, the, you know they've they've well overextended so now people sort of say well what i should what should i do for the second half uh half of the year and should I get out of stocks, which seem to be overvalued? But then at the same time, I'm hearing that the Fed is actually going to be lowering rates, you know, possibly as early as September, which means this, I'd say like, well, if there's lower rates, I should hold my equity performance. And uh, on the other hand, people say, well, if I'm going to have lower rates, lower inflation, slower growth, and they're lowering rates because there's slower growth and lower inflation, I should hold bond. This should be an easy trade. So which one of those two are dominate? And we'll sort of say that both of them are, it could be compelling uh, reasons uh, to in, uh, invest in both stocks and bonds. And when you find that that has a problem that both of them might be then have compelling reasons, you could have a situation that they could become correlated. And if they become correlated, well, then your overall portfolio will actually increase in risk. So, the question comes in is, is they say like, well, if I can't answer the valuation question, then maybe I should just follow the trends in price and let the market tell me or disclose to me what I should do. And that's probably the conclusion that I, you know, I came to is, is, is that while I could find compelling reasons to get out of stocks and hold bonds, and there are also reasons for why, especially in a lower interest rate environment, bonds will do better, but Stocks maybe do even will do better than bonds. Perhaps the best way to approach it is to look at this from a trend following perspective and let the prices themselves tell you what you should do in terms of your action. It's funny how all roads lead to trend following, Mark. Uh, but <laughs> of course, I'm not going to disagree with that point. Um, interestingly enough, you mentioned. If the correlation between stocks and bonds uh, go up, I noticed that the one-year rolling correlation is actually at the highest it's been in a very, very long time at the moment, um, which, again, maybe people haven't been too worried about that because both stocks and bonds up until recently went higher, uh, at least for a while. Um, but it certainly exposes their portfolio from a risk management point of view uh, com- compared to what they may think. Uh, they 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 have in the portfolio. You know, this is an area that uh, I think for a lot of seasoned professionals, it's it's not an issue. But I think for a lot of investors, still, is this is that you say you focus on volatility, volatility. You look at the volatility of every market. 
you also have to be looking at what the, when we look at this in, in terms of a covariance matrix, we have to look at the off diagonal, which is the covariance or the correlations. And if correlations change on you, and if correlations, especially if you have the classic 60-40 portfolio, if it turns positive, this is that you're really going to get a lot more volatility in your overall portfolio. Okay. And then you sort of say, like, I actually took lower return by holding bonds because it was a great diversifier. Now, if the correlation in stocks and bonds goes positive, and it's, uh, then why am I holding bonds if, let's say, that their overall return may be less than equities? So then you have to say, is, is that, well, then I've got to really start to think about valuation because uh, it, then it's a relative return situation, not a diversification question. Yeah. Yeah. Again, actually, that is a very good segue, perhaps, to the next point you brought along. Um, it's something that um, Alan and I briefly touched on last week, uh, but I think uh, you might have some different perspectives. I'd love to hear your opinion about it, but it is a paper that came out uh, as a kind of a, a, um, a joint piece between um, the Sovereign Wealth Fund in Singapore, GIC, and JP Morgan on the topic of building portfolios. So can you talk us through from your perspective why this is uh, a, a good paper to, um, to read? Well, it was a great paper because it was uh, – just about to sort of say that their framework between a large sovereign uh, wealth fund and, and JP Morgan on how they look at alternative hedge, uh, investing hedge, hedge funds. Okay. How do you classify them and how, how do you, uh, you know, sort of determine whether you should, how do you compare one strategy versus another? And, and I, when I first heard it, I said, like, okay, this seems really interesting and I want to have a broad base of interest and, you know, how do people compare different, you know, hedge fund styles? So then I started reading this and as I, as I read more and more into this, I said like, this is as actually probably one of the best explanations for why you should have trend following that I've ever seen. <laughs> so, so, so it wasn't the intent of the paper. It wasn't the, your objective. But when you looked at all of the evidence that they have, that they actually came to the conclusion is that probably the one thing that you need to have in your portfolio is manage futures. Now, so can you visualize that? Can you visualize what what that because that is interesting. I mean, you've read a lot of papers in in your career. So what is it that makes this their argumentation uh, so compelling from our well, point of view? They, they first sort of said that all strategies, all hedge fund strategies can actually be put into four buckets or four types because we'll sort of say even when, uh, and we've had this discussion over and over again, managed futures, all managed futures is, is not trend following. So they, there can be classified differently within that strategy categorization. So first they said there are four different types. There's loss mitigation strategies equity diversifiers, and we'll call it equity complements and equity substitutes. Okay. So uh, then from that, they say, well, to look at those four classifications, we have to look at three characteristics. Okay. And the characteristics they look at, they say like, well, one, you want to look at what's the correlation with equities. Okay. Okay. So a good diversifier is, is going to be someone that has low correlation, right? Uh, an equity substitute would probably have high correlation and something that has low correlation would be closer to an equity diversifier. So, so in that uh, perspective is, is that we could classify all hedge funds by, based on their correlation. The second characteristic is their drawdown mitigation, and this is relative to equities. So if you have an equity substitute Okay, and it has a high correlation with equities, it's probably not going to provide a lot of drawdown mitigation. Okay, so that's the second characteristic we're going to look at. And the third characteristic is that after we account for beta, okay, what is the alpha that's left over? What, you know, is it an alpha generator? Okay. So I said, seems to make sense. 
we've talked about each one of these three individually. And they say, let's, well, let's put it all together and say, well, let's look at what are the strategies that actually could give you all of those characteristics. And you say like, oh, lo and behold here, low correlation. Uh, trend following seems to do that. Okay, check. That's check one. So, uh, so if we look at the uh, spectrum across correlation, you know, uh, trend following is probably on the, on, the, on the low end. Okay, let's like draw down mitigation. Okay, now that's that's sort of the crisis alpha. Let's let's take a look at what uh, all the different hedge fund st uh, strategies there. Uh, lo and behold, trend following seems to be given a drawdown mitigation. Check on that. Uh, let's look at alpha, and then we sort of say like, well, no one has probably sort of really talked about trend following as uh, uh, an alpha generator, but at the same time, is is that we do use the, the term crisis alpha. You know, I think that it's a mixed metaphor, but that's a different discussion. But what they did is they looked at the beta line and then they looked at the, all the different strategies and they said, well, is it, uh, get, does it generate positive or, or negative alpha relative to its, uh, its beta? And lo and behold, managed futures is probably number two. Number one was, uh, was uh, global ma global macro. So, you got positive alpha on that on that sense. So then you sort of say, like, given their characteristics of what you want to look for and the characteristics of what you think you should have from hedge funds, you say you'd like to sort of see, and, and you don't get it for everything, but you want to have low correlation, drawdown mitigation, and alpha. And then, and then if you look at what is the strategy that seems to fit within that, it's probably trend following on all three of those counts. So even though they didn't say to say that this is our objective with the paper, this is what I, I drew from the, uh, or the conclusion that I drew. Of course, ab absolutely. Now, I haven't read the paper uh, myself, but if they didn't draw that conclusion, that seems pretty clear when you explain it like that. <laughs> what was their take, their own takeaway, so to speak? And, and did they have a different agenda, so to speak? Because... Again, yeah, no, there are sovereign wealth funds out there for sure who have large allocations to trend following and CTAs. We know that for sure. But JP Morgan is not a firm that strikes me as being a big promoter of trend following. They may have some exposure to it. But so what 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 did they plan to get uh, out of the paper um, that was different to, to your conclusion? Well, well, I think that their 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 intent was not to sort of make this a uh, a paper about trend following or the uh, benefits from managed futures. I think that they they were just sort of saying we're developing a framework. Our framework is, is say, saying that we're going to uh, categorize all hedge fund strategies according to risk mitigation, diversifier, complement substitutes, and then but then the data sort of spoke for itself. They say like, well. If you, if it sort of say is one, um, you know, if you want an equity substitute, you're not going to pick managed futures. Okay, uh, if you're looking for risk mitigation, definitely you want to try trend following. So, so I, th I think it's a, it was they're trying to sort of say we're trying to have an agnostic view. We just want to provide a framework, and then uh, we'll uh, then it's up to you as the reader to sort of determine what you want to try to get from this and. Uh, now, perhaps this is it, uh, you know, to, uh, depending on your perspective, you'll get a different conclusion, but, you know, I think that it, it, it just jumped out at me, uh, given that when I walked in to have the, uh, do this read, I didn't have a view that this is what I thought this was going to be the paper about trend following. It's only at the end that I said, I said, you know, this is a great, uh, a great story, it's a great argument for why you should hold trend following. Yeah, no, I, I like that. And uh, hopefully the paper will give some inspiration uh, to uh, all the people who, uh, who will be diving into it. Now, from what the heart is full of, Mark, to something slightly different, uh, namely a book that you came across, which incidentally I uh, came across as well. I haven't read the book, but I've heard an interview with one of the authors, Philip Carson 
Schlesak. I'm not entirely sure yes. how you pronounce. Uh, okay. The other author is Paul Swartz, um, and uh, the book is called Stocks, Crisis, and False Alarms, How to Assess True Macroeconomic Risk. And interestingly enough, I have suggested to uh, our uh, friend and co-host, uh, Kevin, that he uh, invite uh, these uh, authors to his series, which is all about uh, authors and, and new books. But we'll see if that if that works out later in the year. Um, so yeah, so it's interesting when you put it on the agenda, saying, "Yeah, I want to talk about this." Um, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, I'm I'm not going to steal the author's thunder if let's say you could get them onto your podcast, which I think would be a great idea. But you know, I think that they said this is that well, what we really have to do is we have to worry about the, how do we uh, how do we think about shocks and crisis, and that sometimes that the there's. We expect that there should be a shock or a crisis, but then it turns out to be a false alarm. And the problem comes in is is, is that that we often use judgment that's you know wedded in a specific model or school of thought. Okay, perfect example is is, is that we had a big increase in uh, in money from QE. How many people thought that we were going to have rampant inflation right after the last great financial crisis? And it just never, it, it never occurred. If anything is, is that we are fighting an issue that we couldn't even get up to 2% inflation. So, so if you are wedded to a specific model or think uh, or thought, then you're, you're actually could have a, uh, a false alarm and you didn't, were, weren't able to truly assess macroeconomic risk. Similarly, is is that we have a lot of of, of macroeconomists that are doomsdayers. Is that they uh, they, uh, they make their bones by uh, by suggesting that the world is going to come to an end. And what we find out is is that for a lot of things, this is that the economy has actually done better than what we expected. Look at COVID. You know, I think that a lot of people thought that the global economy has come uh, grind to a halt. There's no question it was it was an extremely sharp reduction. But I think what was really surprising was how fast we came out of that, how fast it, there was a reversal in that. And so I think the argument was is, is that you shouldn't put stock in a specific model. You should uh, ensure that you have a debate about uh, uh, assessing alternatives and that you shouldn't be swayed by, you know, sort of doomsday thinkers. And what that really sort of came out to us is that when we talk about this from the context of our podcast, is is that I really go back to the the basics to say is is that prices are primal, and use prices as your sort of your null hypothesis. This is is that you know I like to sort of say start with a null, and then maybe if you need to deviate, you could think about it, but sort of let the prices speak for itself is, is to say like, this is what the, this is what the market is telling me. And then from there, I could sort of say either I, I, I could make an adjustment or I just follow what the prices are going to do. And, and I think that, uh, they would sort of say, don't chase the numbers. You know, let's say like we get the PC, PCE that came out today is that there are a lot of people who are going to spend a lot of ink telling you about PCE. When, when in reality, what you do want to do is, what's the price action that you see in markets in the next couple of days? And that's going to be what the real driver. So I think it was a refreshing, different view on macroeconomics. Uh, it doesn't say that you should be a trend follower, but it also sort of said this is that you should be a healthy skeptic of whatever economists that you might be following or you read about. Yeah, no, I think that's a perfect, actually, uh, that's a very good uh uh, appetizer or teaser for uh, if we're able to get uh, uh, one of the authors on the podcast later in the year. And uh, I thought actually as well when I heard uh, an interview with them um, that it was an interesting, uh, interesting topic and a different take. Now, Mark, as always, we are close to running out of time, but we still have so many topics left. So I'm going to let you choose uh, which ones. Maybe we can tackle another two before we wrap up uh, for this week. Um, so maybe you choose two that you think are, are really relevant, interesting from where we are right now. Well, I hate to rain on the uh, AI, we'll call it machine learning uh, parade, but I think that that's worth uh, 
spending some time on uh, because especially when we talk often about systematic model building, we talk about trend following, we talk about quant work. This is the, there's some interesting papers that have come out uh, that uh, you know give us a reason to pause about some of our thinking about machine learning and AI. One is this is that there's a a piece and you get it from my my blog is is that they looked at LLM large language model uh, models and they tied it to time series. So they say like, well, if I use an LLM model, is is that and I tr uh, apply this to, in addition to time series modeling, can I get improvements? And what they find out that that's not the case. And they say, well, I thought that everybody is, is sp uh, spending time on LLM models. Everybody's working on this. Now, the test that they performed is very specific, but it did do a comparison in a number of different approaches. And they said that LLM models did, may not be able to add as much value as what you think. And I sort of say that the, and I think that what I'm hearing from a lot of researchers is that they're spending a lot of money on large language, you know, uh, models. I'm not sure exactly what the output they're getting or whether it's been successful or not. So, so I think it just causes a little bit uh, pause to say that model building is a lot harder than what what you may think. And second is is that there's been another paper that looked at machine learning and uh, across the business cycle, and they say like machine learning does pretty well during up parts of the business cycle, but then when you hit the down uh, the downdraft, when you hit a recession, is is actually the market performance is actually gets a lot worse. And when you think about it, this is that if you're training a model, you have only a few periods of recession. And then most of the periods are, are during expansion. You should expect that it's going to be trained on what the most data you have. And so it might actually do a lot worse during a recession. Again, you know, uh, time to pause and sort of say that maybe machine learning doesn't have all the answers just yet. Yeah, and and also I would just add that our industry is one of few industries that really have gone through many quote unquote technology revolutions. I mean, from the introduction of the internet and and all of these things. And every time, at least in the thirty plus years that I've been doing this, and I'm sure um, people would have heard the same before that time, people were quick to to kind of state that this would have a negative impact on trend following. Why wouldn't it? I mean, suddenly all everybody has all this information. Now everybody has all this power, technology power of some sort. But of course, it's um, so far at least has not proven to be uh, the case. One should never say never. But I think there's a lot of uh, um, experience is hard to backtest. Let's put it that way. And um, I'm sure also an AI uh, would find it hard to to put on the uh, experience, the real experience that uh, many of these firms, our colleagues in the industry, have gone through. So, there's no question as this is that uh, there's there's a reason to do a lot of work on new techniques, and there will be you know ways that you can exploit markets using new techniques. But the answer is not going to be digital, like like. We just need to switch, and it's an on-off switch that we should go from one set of models to a new set of models. And so I've really spent a lot of time thinking about this, and and I said, like, why do we search for models, and why do we go through this? And and I go back to you know sort of the idea of uh, information theory. And when I think about this, is is that all the prices that we have, they're public information, okay. All the you had some great announcements this morning. That's public information in efficient markets. Is, is is that that public information? All that information is going to be discounted in prices almost immediately. So so what is the purpose of building models? And the purpose of building models is to take public information, which could be past prices or macro data, and then we want to turn it into private information. Private information is is that we contort it, we mold it, we switch it into something that we find useful and that's private that other people don't have, and then I could sort of use that private information 
to be, tell me something about what might be going on in market prices today, which means it could be I'm trying to, I'm not saying it's a forecast, it could just say I'm doing a better job of being able to explain where prices may be headed. So why do we want to use a new technique? Well, a new technique is another way in which we could take the public information that everybody has and mold it into some private information that might give me some insights that other people don't have. So, so that so in a, an efficient market, we're constantly looking to try to say, like, how do we sort of create that private edge? And we sort of say, if everybody's using the same data, so for example, we were talking about cocoa markets, is it? Everybody has cocoa prices. So what can we do with those cocoa prices that's different than the next person that could tell me something that other people don't know? And that's why, that's the process we're going through. But because it's hard, often, to, and we're all using the same information to start with, it's not clear that just because we want to contort it into some private information is going to work. Yeah. No, oh, actually, that's that's a great way of explaining it. Actually, um, I think the final thing that I want to talk is is that then uh, I you know, I'll, I'll leave this as a uh, a conversation that we should have more of. And uh, there's been some research done, and it, it's uh, and we've talked about uh, other people have talked about this before, and this is in the behavioral economic area. It's called the law of small numbers. The law of small numbers says is that that we create what we call the gambler's fallacy or the hot hand problem is, is that we often extrapolate from a small sample on what we might think what will happen in the, in the future as opposed to using a very large sample. Okay. A perfect example is, is that the hot hand problem was this is that, well, if you have a basketball shooter and let's say he's made three, three point shots in a row. So, what do you think we should do? And you say like, hey, give him the ball. He's got a hot hand. <laughs> you know, that you know, let's extrapolate from that small sample, assume that he's going to continue on and do the uh, do the same. Okay. Now, on the other hand, this is that you have a gambler's fallacy. This is that, that let's say uh, I'm I'm playing a game and I'm flipping coins and I've had five heads in a row. What do you think I should do on my next bet? So a lot of people would sort of say like, well, by definition, if there's been five heads in a row, it's got to come up tails next because, you know, it's a, it's a coin. It's a, it's, it should be 50, 50 over the, over the long run. So therefore I should, you know, mean revert yet when you say what's the chance of having a tail after five heads in a row, still 50, 50. It's still a flip of the coin. Uh, so what happens is, is that uh, you know, well, the problem in behavioral finance has been is, is that we sort of say like, I can use this gambler's fallacy and a hot hand problem to explain why I should extrapolate. It also can explain why I should mean revert. So there is some mathematics about like whether you assume that you know the distribution or not. If you know the distribution, then you probably, you're always going to be a... Uh, a mean reverter. If you don't know the distribution, then you might sort of follow the hot hand. But when you think about all of our trend following and all of our models, is, is that oftentimes we have to make a lot of decisions off of very limited data. So we're constantly faced with the law of small numbers. So uh, in a lot of the decisions you make. So when we think about your trend following model, where you think about any quant model, I ask that all of your uh, listeners between now and our next uh, call to say, think about your sample size, think about the distribution, and see whether you think that you might be falling into the problem of the law of small numbers. That's a great way to uh, end the conversation. Uh, as always, Mark, really uh, insightful and and uh, some different um, things I think we'll leave the audience with uh, this week. Now, wrapping up this conversation, of course, hoping that uh, everyone enjoyed it. Um, please take a few minutes to go and uh, leave a rating and review or share the podcast with your 
like-minded friends uh, as it is simply the best way for us to grow the podcast that is from rec being recommended by someone who's actually listening uh, to it. So uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Next week, I'm joined by Jem. Uh, no doubt we're going to have a conversation about the crazy world we live in right now um, and also maybe as a follow-up on the conversation we had with uh, uh, Macro Elf uh, last week uh, so uh, or this week actually I think it was released so um, lots of good stuff to uh, dig into and of course as usual uh, if you want even more trend following information we are publishing quite a lot uh, on the website every week we do a summary Uh, of the uh, world in trend, so to speak, and and we just published our monthly uh, update uh, that Rich and I work on together. So uh, there should be plenty of uh, stuff to uh, keep you entertained, for sure, besides the Olympics, of course. From Mark and me, thank you ever so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you next week. And until next time, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.